we have a very special guest in our midst, in the person of Donet Ingrid Zaka, a name synonymous with some of the most fantastic images captured, especially across our island of people, places, things, flora, and fauna. Let me take the opportunity to welcome to our platform of why I write, Donet Ingrid Zaka. Welcome, Donet. Thank How you so much. Good night. Awesome. Welcome, Donet. How Thank are you doing? Thank you. I am well. I'm well. This is really a chance or the season to <laughs> rest and reflect. So oh, I've yes. spent three days at home. I'm I'm wonderful. I'm good. Thanks for asking. <laughs> I am so excited to hear that. And I'm glad that you have the opportunity tonight, this evening, today, to just sit with us and have this wonderful, artful article conversation about you and your fantastic work over the years. You know, Donnet, when I dropped the promo on my page that you were coming on, I was getting some of the most beautiful inbox messages from folk. Yes. You told me how you impacted their lives. <laughs> wow. Students. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yes. Former students of Walmers and other folk at, at the Jamaica School of Art, as it was known back then. But, you know, I want to start off by talking about the first time I met you, I came across you. I don't remember when. <laughs> It's like you've always been there, but here's what impacted me the most. Donnet, you were at, um, it was, it was an art show. It was an art show for the school of art, you know, while it is called the Edna Manley college, right. you know, you always have that, um, art show for the students. Like what is it? At the end of the year, graduation right. exhibition. Right. One of the most exhilarating experiences that I've had in my life to be able to witness the work of students that can compare with any outstanding internationally acclaimed artists across the world. I, right. some of the, I saw some of the best artwork, the jewelry, you know, that I saw, the textiles that I saw. And I remember you came up to me and we were discussing whatever art we were both looking at. And I said to myself, wow, this is Donna Ingrid Zaka. She is so down to earth and easy to talk to. <laughs> oh I boy. I remember that. I remember that. And that could have been as early as maybe 2001, 2002. So it was just in the early 2000s. Right, right. And to see that after 20 odd years since I met you there, and I know you started before that, you're still in the game. Donna, what inspires you and keeps you doing what you do? What inspires me? I spend a lot of my time on the outside. So when COVID was happening, for example, and I had to stay inside, I was most miserable. Mm -hmm. So a big part of what keeps me alive is to be able to get up, to even go into my backyard, to look around the plants I have there, then to jump in my van and go somewhere. Anywhere is good enough. Mm -hmm. it's not the where I'm always looking for something different new mm -hmm. faces new experiences that fill me up mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that is my life yes I like to meet the people in addition to taking the pictures I like to just to meet the people hang with them and you know, have discussions so do you consider yourself first and foremost a photojournalist a photographer lecturer educator inspiration <laughs> giver or all of the above how do, would you describe yourself oh my god i started teaching first but i think i have now evolved into being a photographic artist mm. so i was teaching first and then i worked with the newspaper for a little while my experience is really wide mm -hmm. so i did a little work with the, the gallery and i did a little work with the museum and i have been going around so yeah. I've touched about just about everything, but yeah. now I can relax at home mm -hmm. and construct my own art. Got it. So let's go all the way back to the beginning. You are a daughter of the St. James soil. That's yes. where you had your origins. 
Tell us a little bit about what it's like growing up in your part of St. James, which later won its position of having a second city. Tell us a little bit of your early years. Did your early years give you any hint that you would be where you are today? So let's start there. Okay. I am from Cambridge, St. James. It's a, it's a district that's about 15 miles away from Montego Bay. Mm-hmm. Um, well, you know, a district have everything, churches, school and everything and your neighbors. My mother died when I was four years old. Mm. My father, I think, became a very lonely person. Mm. So he had me at four years old and he had my sister at two. And what he did a lot was to put us in his car and to drive all over the place. Mm. In driving all over the place, my sister was always fighting to get the front seat. So, hey, go to the front seat. I would lie on the back seat and just look up through the windows. Mm. I would observe the trees, the sea, the, anywhere we went. I would just look around. And my father would always bring things to, to our attention. Look mm. at this tiny plant. Look at this bloom. Look at this. Look at that. And so I got into the habit of observing. And I find I am doing the same thing to the little boy next door to me. Mm. This, look at the snails. So I didn't grow up feeling afraid of anything. Mm. I grew up, I went to primary school in Bickersteth, which is a district four miles away from Cambridge on the way to, to, towards Montego Bay. And then I went to Malta Alverna High School I spent seven years at Malta Verne High School, and then I, I applied to just to continue to concretize my art. So I started off at Malta Verne High School doing everything art. And then a nun who was on the staff, Sister Marita Francis, started a dark room. And I was probably one of six persons who just enjoyed going to that dark room. So I got my kick for photography right there. So Mm -hmm. I learned how to process a roll of film and how to make prints. Mm -hmm. Then I found a gentleman in Montego Bay. His name was McGill. I think it's Arthur McGill. And McGill would teach me how to make prints. So I've been lucky. I've been Mm -hmm. lucky. I started, I think I started my career right there. Look at that. Went to school of art, did graphic designing. Mm-hmm. Really liked photography, and continue with that. Yeah. I worked in the I worked in an agency for about three months, and that was it. <laughs> a little bit too restrictive and keep with you, <laughs> and, you know, keep your wings kind of thing. <laughs> because you had to, you know, align what you're doing with what the client wants. Right. What was required right. of you? Yeah, yeah exactly. Did. So restrictive. Yep. Yeah. I did a six month stint at a an, an agency as well, but um, I wanna you to recall for us what was the first camera that you held in your hand well my uncle came from a one summer we were at home and my uncle came to jamaica and he had a little point and shoot it's called a kodak instamatic mm-hmm. you know i have one in my collection because it's something you have to have if that's where you started it was like a little beanie box camera and mm-hmm. it was a little cartridge that fit to the back. And I started with my Instamatic camera. Mm-hmm. Oh, yes. I started there. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, we had to give the film out to a studio and they would process the role and make the prints. And then I would show my father and we would go through them. We never knew anything about composing or anything. It was just, you have a pretty picture or you have so-and-so, you know. Mm-hmm. That, and the feeling was great. So I continued. Mm-hmm. I liked it. Yes. Do you remember when you bought your first expensive camera? What what would be considered an expensive camera? What was it? I bought, uh, it was called a Yashica. Mm. And that was like 1982. I would have been in second year and we were told that we needed a camera. But guess what? It was a big savings I had to do to, to buy my camera. My father wouldn't even puke for me. No, we want camera for. I sent you to art school. I thought you were going here to draw and paint. What are you doing with that camera? That mm. kind of attitude. So I went to the gentleman. I said, I would like to buy that camera. And he said, but it's very expensive. I said, I will pay you a little bit at a time. 
and he gave it to me. Mm. And so I went home every two weeks from Kingston to Cambridge and I would go to the gentleman and pay him a little bit more. Mr. McGill was a photographer. You know, you have a little photographer in the district. Mr. McGill was a photographer. Wow. Yes. So I learned more now how to process the film. I could do more on my own. Mm. Play around with meter, play around with aperture and shutter speed, that kind of thing. I was learning much more. Mm -hmm. Yes. You know, as, as you talk about shutter speed, immediately what comes to mind is being at a sports meet, a relay race, maybe at a pen relays or a boys champs. Right. You know? It seems to me that it requires a different skill of our photographer, along, of course, with the tool to capture those images. As an educator, as a teacher, how would you explain to us who don't know all of those details? How do we get this perfect running shot okay. <laughs> of an athlete dashing by with these shutter speeds? So the camera has a set of basic functions. If you have what's considered a 35 millimeter camera, it has a set of basic functions. The shutter that you use to press, the, you take a picture, the shutter, and the aperture, there are little openings in the lens, and those are called aperture. Your shutter is important when you have to capture anything that has to do with speed. Mm. Um, people in motion, somebody riding a bike, a kite going in the sky, the shutter is where you have to concentrate, is what you have to concentrate on. Mm. The aperture, which is the opening in the lens, is what you concentrate on if you're doing small plants, if you want a diffused background, when you want to emphasize the subject and you don't want to have the complication of what is going around behind you. You mm. have to concentrate on adjusting your shutter. Now, each time you adjust your shutter, you have to adjust your aperture. Your, your, each time you adjust your aperture, the opening in the lens, right. you adjust the shutter. So the wider you get, the faster the shutter speed will go. To photograph sportsmen, people moving, a ball in flight and so on, it is your shutter. So you open the aperture, you get a very fast shutter speed. Mm. There is more to the camera though, because there's what's called your ISO, your shutter mm. sensitivity, mm. your white balance. There's a lot more to learn. You really need to have a little course in photography. Yes, to, it's to all like a big all course. It is. <laughs> it is all like a big course. <laughs> it is. But now you can use your phone and probably get yeah. a lot of what um, you need yes. to get. Yeah, you know, and I want us to talk about the progress of the tools used in photography today as opposed to when you started. So when you were at Mount Alvernia High, you got bitten by the photography bug. You got bitten by the art bug, you know. Were you encouraged towards Jamaica School of Art as it was back then? Or did you have to insist that, you know, this is where I'm going for further studies. I'm leaving Cambridge and this is where I'm going to go. What was that process like? And I'm going to tell you what I said before. I'm happy, I'm happy you know asking that. Artists, I, right? I'm happy you're asking that. I think my dad wanted me to be a dentist. And when I told him that I was going to the School of Art, he said, but you can't make any money there. Mm. And him say, you know something else? A pure rasta do what? You mm. want to be a rasta? No, daddy. But I like art and I would like to go and study art. And then he said to me, where are you going to go in Kingston? We don't know anybody there. And I remember at Mount Alverna, there was a girl who was a friend of mine. And her mom lived in Kingston. And I asked her if it was all right for me to come and to do the entrance exam. And she said, yes. I remember that about four of us slept in the room. Mm -hmm. It was a small space. And she took me that day to the school and she left me there. I did the exam. But when I was over with the exam, I couldn't find the entrance. I couldn't figure out where I walked into the school. Somebody mm -hmm. said, get around some man. This is a gear towards the police section. I walk out there, I was completely lost. Mm. So the first day was hard, but I knew that <laughs> this was what I wanted to do. Love I that. Knew that I knew that 
art was what I wanted to do. And in going through the school, I discovered that there were other elements to art. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There was graphic design, there was sculpture, there was textiles, mm -hmm. you know, there was all of this. And then by the time I got to my second year, we were asked to kind of uh, start thinking about which of these areas you want to specialize in. Mm. And I chose graphic designing. Mm -hmm. While I was halfway through graphic designing, I thought I wanted to do art education as well. So I was adding another measure to what I was doing. It was a lot of work, but I was encouraged. You know, I was encouraged to, well, you're good, you know, keep it up. Just go to the class, just to, you know. Who um, are some of the voices? Who were some of the lecturers back then that spoke into your life? and kept you on track, who would you say? Yeah. Jerry Craig. Jerry Craig was actually the, the principal of the, the, the director of that school. Mm -hmm. Hope Brooks. Mm -hmm. Hope Brooks uh, is probably still there teaching um, mm -hmm. history. There was Cecil Cooper, Christopher mm -hmm. Gonzalez, mm -hmm. Alexander Cooper. Those are old names. Yes, but they were the ones. They were the ones there. They were the Star ones, there. and they knew what they were doing. I guess now they would be a little bit confused with all the teaching styles and all the things you have to do in a to a course and mm -hmm. understanding globalization and all that. But they laid the perfect foundation at that time in that school. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yes, what are some of the what are the some of the core values that you found yourself working with working alongside that kept you on track in an area that wasn't law it wasn't medicine it wasn't dentistry it wasn't even um you know all those other ones not even and Indian right <laughs> right and even though mm -hmm. it wasn't you had to learn to be disciplined you had to learn to be fair to yourself and to the others who worked with you. Share space. Understand what you want to achieve and work for it. It was mm -hmm. not easy. It was not, it was not an easy time. In the 80s, when I went to school, there was all kinds of things happening in that, that PNP regime. Um, mm -hmm. There were students at school who couldn't go home. They couldn't get home at night. I had to learn to share what I had with them. Hmm. Food, material, whatever we shared among ourselves. That was a community. Yes. It was also a good time to learn. Hmm. It was a good time to learn. We never had to show up on each other. We yes. had to share what we had. That, that, was, that was valuable to all of us. Hmm. Buzz Watson. Denise Salmon, all of these people who came out of the art and who are still doing well, came mm -hmm. through school with me at that time. Mm. That's was, warm. Yes, 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 yes. It was a great time. Mm -hmm. People like David Dunn and... Um, loved his sculpture, loved his ceramic pieces. Yes, loved yes, yes. Mm -hmm. They would they would cook down in the ceramic department and we would go down there and eat. Mm -hmm. The girls would be grooming the boys and the boys would be doing things to the girls. It was a community. That is exactly what it was. Mm -hmm. But I have grown up to teach there and see the changes and it's all right. You know? Yeah, because, you know, as you said to me during our prep for tonight's chat, you said, you know what? It's just life. It's just life, all the changes, yes, you know, the different functions, everything. And I love your openness to accepting this, which made you quite a study to start teaching, to actually graduating from School of Art in 1980 and go out into the school to teach. Tell us about your foray into education and teaching at our high schools. in. I, I, okay, I, I did art education at Edna. Right. When I left, I thought I was a graphic artist. Doing. First of all, I'm this graphic artist. <laughs> Secondly, I am a teacher. And then I went to work with McCann Erickson. And mm. for the first three or four weeks, I was working on this Kentucky scratch and win ad. I disliked it. 
I couldn't stand the pressure of, you have to change this, or the price has gone up here, Shopper's Fair is doing a fair, Shopper's Fair is having a sale. I couldn't stand it. And one day something just said, it's not you. It is not you. I went back and I spoke to, to Jerry Craig and then he said, you know something? There's going to be an opening at Woolmer's Boys School. And so this is now the teaching side that we'll have to trip in. I went to the, the principal at, at, at Woolmer's, Coolridge Barnett. Mm -hmm. And I did the interview and I am sitting down there waiting for him to say to me, uh, okay, Miss Zaka, you can start next week. And so, you know, I'm sitting there waiting. And then he said, what? And I said, sir, you have not discussed with me when I should come. And he said, oh, that will be tomorrow. I nearly dropped down the nervousness take me I could get up tomorrow I don't have no clothes I don't have no I start thinking how tomorrow but I turned up the next day and I was taken to the art department and you know what was there I was I was aware of what the space would look like and so on mm -hmm, I started mm -hmm. the following day and I had about 30 students that was frightening but right it, yeah, it happened. <laughs> a high school is not, it's hard work, you know. High school is a not. A boy's school. A boy's boy school. school. And a little teacher. A yes, little person. Boy, little kid. Yes. yes. A little person among all of these boys. But you know something? It went well. There was respect. I demanded that and I got it. Mm. And then there was this warmth and there was a nice little comrade with yours, friendship. Um, I remember Ro Roger Hamilton, Gary Sadler. I remember those names. Those were boys who would come to the art room to write and to say the poetry. Mm. And so we had a combination of visual artists in the room. We had these people who would speak, you know, the poetry. Mm. And, and we, it, it, was, it was a great time. I learned a lot. So I spent five years at Woolmer's Boys School. That is good. That is great. Yeah. You. You, so you created an, and an, it's almost like an artistic oasis. Right. At the school. That place was, the art room was the third floor of one of the B block or something like that. And at lunchtime, students would escape and come up here. We would have a good time. And I hear you used to be busy selling hot dogs over there too. Hot dogs and lemonade and that kind of thing at lunchtime. Yes, yes, yes. Yes. So, so I had a little staff room, but we never really used it as a staff room. It was a little room where I could make all of these things to encourage the students to come up and while they eat, to just sit around and express themselves. That was exactly what happened. Loved it. They got their lunch. We sat in a little circle. And mm. you know, for reason, I want to get for reason, get for reason, yes, I want to get for reason, get for reason. It wow. was a lovely time, it was a lovely time, it was I a love lovely that. time. And one of your students have come about now to be from Wilmers, have come about to be now a, another celebrated artist in his own right, Garfield Morgan. I know, isn't that good? Mm -hmm. I love this. I love this. So, you know, the, the circle continues, the it circle does. expands, and we love that. What brought you to the decision of leaving teaching at Wilma's when you did? Uh, I was in, because I was doing so well in photography, a space was now created at Edna Malik, well, the School of Art, to teach in that department. Mm. We had for a long time an American man and he had to go back. So there was going to be a space. I thought at this time, this is going to be an opportunity for me to grow and know to specialize even more in photography. So this is a good reason now to step away from teaching boys at this level to teaching uh, in the college, teaching right. at college level. Mm -hmm, and, mm -hmm. and it worked for me. It also gave me the opportunity to use their dark room and to explore. So I was building myself 
-hmm. At the same time, I was teaching. Yes. Yes. When you, I'm, I'm sorry, Donna. When you say that you were doing so well in photography while being a teacher at Woolmers, how, how does that compute? Was it that you were doing work professionally outside? You know, how did you grow your photography business and skill while a teacher? So while I was at Woolmers in the afternoon, I would teach part-time at Edna. Ah. Our time, maybe two or three days a week. And then I would also do work for the newspaper. Ah. The ah. Jamaica Herald was a popular newspaper. I actually went to set up the, you remember the Jamaica Herald? It's an old newspaper. I went to set up the dark room downtown at the Jamaica Herald. Mm. I remember when they wanted to take a bus off the wharf and I was the only one with a general driver's license. And I had to... <laughs> I had to go for this bus. So I worked with them for a while, but this was part time. Mm. And they would call me at all hours in the night. Oh, there's yeah. an accident on Reddy's Road, something like that. Or one of my fun jobs with the Herald was to go to um, Jamaica House to photograph the Governor General receiving something from a group of people. Mm -hmm. I was late. I was late. And I ran inside this space. The security guard said, they, they're in there, they're in there. And when I opened the door and went in there, everybody was, everybody had gotten up from the seat and the governor general was saying his goodbyes and so on. And you had these two soldiers standing up there and I kind of raised my hand and the, and the GG said, but you are late. And I said, yes, sir, I am aware of it. And then he just said, Guys, would you all just sit down? You know, he, w <laughs> he went back to how they were before I got yes. here. And then he I said, just, just think, mm. but it was a lesson for me because he said, um, you know, if you have to go somewhere for seven o'clock, get there for six. Mm -hmm. I, I, I got a lesson from him, you know, just doing that. And yes. I was grateful for that. I have a lot of experience. <laughs> A whole load of experiences. Okay, on okay, you know what? This, our conversation is just the start of the memoir that you need to do. It's important. It's the start of the memoir, the Donnett Ingrid Zaka memoir. And I tell you this, when I think of Donnett Ingrid Zaka, and you're going to have to tell me why all of your name has to be said. Uh -huh. you know, when I think of Donnett Ingrid Zaka, um, the first photographer, professional pro photographer in Jamaica that comes to mind is Maria Lyakona. You yeah. are now Maria Lyakona in this age because she's the one who did all of our photographs, for instance, at, at Immaculate back in the day. Um, so you are synonymous with just leading the charge. Of course, we have our Brian Rosens and we have our other ones, of course, but certainly. Um, we definitely look to you as, as an outstanding waymaker in this business. So we do need to have the memoir. That's true. That's true. Um, Maria Lycona, I lift my hat to her. I've been to her and I've got my lessons too. Because in those years when you're growing up, it was, it was hard, you know. Mm -hmm. My first 16 by 20 print that I made in a dark room. A girlfriend of mine said, it looks good. Let us go to Maria Lycona. Let us go. I know Maria. I say, nervous do you know? I say, all right. Let me go and see Maria with my nice 16 inches by 20 inches print. When I went to Maria, knock on the door, my, my great friend said, Oh, Maria brought Donna to meet you. She's into photography and, you know, she wants to see some of your... The woman said to me, let me see your work. I nervous again. I showed her the work and she said, come with me. And I, she walked me down our corridor into her dark room and she raised the guillotine and she chopped the four corners of my huge 16 by 20 print down to about an 8 by 10. And she gave it back to me and she said, this is your image. I think I cried for about three days. Wow. But it was a learning experience. 
what I have done now is that I have taken photography to another level. I have started to construct. I'm making art out of photography, which is a little bit more than journalism or documentary, you know, that kind of photography that Maria did a lot of. So I have learned how to use it, the camera as tool. That's, Can you explain, that, that, that's a very interesting story. Can you please um, just tell me what was the lesson of cutting down that huge print you were so proud of? Okay. And this guru cut up your picture. Cut up my print because that guru understood how to compose. That is very valuable in photography. Got so it. when you hold up your camera to take a picture, you must ask yourself, what is it I want? What is it do I really want to photograph? What is it do I want my audience to see? And after you say that to yourself, how am I going to show that subject? So I am looking at you here and I am seeing you, I'm seeing a plant in the back, I'm seeing the curtain on this side and I'm seeing a little plaque or something to the top left hand side. I have to decide what is it about what I am seeing here that I want to show all the guys who are watching. So cropping would simply mean I'm going to, if I wanted you, to take you away from the background that I am looking at or take the plant away from, the, from everything else or take the drape away. Composition is very, very important in arresting the viewer. You have to find something that is comfortable to look at, to keep your focus. You have to find that. When you send those pictures of the, you, you posted some pictures of three guys, like Oliver Samuel, somebody, and, and just, when you look at their faces to me, that is the image. Mm. You, can, uh, you can pull their expressions out. You can, this one is Oliver, this one is this, and there are three different persons with three different expressions. And mm. that is what is valuable. Mm. I That's love it. I love this. This is real old school teaching. It is. So, <laughs> I love it. I, I'm loving it because it makes me understand that even if we are not professional photographers, what I know for sure is that as viewers, you know, watching the things through the lens of your photographer's camera, then we get to read the same image slash message that you intend for us to see. So you are literally by capturing an image correctly, appropriately, you're also schooling us as viewers as to what look good, what makes sense from what don't look good and what don't make sense. Right. In the meantime, please go ahead and tell me why it is that we have to call out all of your name, Donnit. Donnit Ingrid Zaka, beautiful name. I, you know something, I like all of my names. And I wonder, why is it that they gave us middle names and, and, and we don't get a chance to use it? So from, you know, I used to enter festival and I wanted to be absolutely different. So I started with D. Ingrid first, D. Ingrid Zaka. And then I changed it and said, wait, you want to use all your name? I'm wrong with that. Use all your name. Mm -hmm. I like it. I like it too. I like my name too. <laughs> Listen, I feel strongly about that myself. I think I always say a thing about our names. Our names is this which if you have done a spot of work for a week and you're supposed to get your pay, if somebody else's name is on your paycheck, you can't cash. <laughs> That's true. You, yeah, you did the work and everything. But your name is not, a, they made a mistake mm -hmm. and you can't cash that check. Oh my goodness, you would not be a happy camper at all. So let's just take this opportunity to just view with Donnet while she's like, first of all, let me go back to our promo. I love the, I love butterflies. So it's no wonder that I reached for this image that you did of uh, these several, how do you get these butterflies? You know, something oh. after the first big shower of rain this year, we had this long drought and then one day we had a big shower of rain. The day after, two days after, all of these came into my backyard, one at a time. 
So we still had bloom from the Christmas poinsettia and all of those little uh, plants growing up mm. attracted the different kinds of colors. Mm. Did you know that the same butterflies don't go to the same plants? I learned that this year. Really? Right. They don't all go to the same plant. I don't know why. I need to find that out. But I learned that this year. They're very picky. I got it. All right. So you always have to be ready with that camera. Right. So in the mornings, I eat my breakfast in the backyard on the tree. Mm. And I watch everything. I watch the lizards. I watch the stray cats that come along, the butterflies. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Nice. These images, these wonderful studies of these Jamaican women that we are looking at. How do you go about, I love this lady with our pencil in our head? That I don't lady- think- Right. Yes. That lady with the pencil in her head is a revivalist. Yes. But what I like, and that's not the complete image because there's a tie head and so on. Mm. What I like most about her is just the, the, the fabric of the face, the way her face is shaped. You can tell she's African. There is no doubt. It's a particular tribe. Mm. The nose is shape I see, a, a particular way. It's a sturdy face. It's a powerful woman, a strong black woman. And I like that. Mm. So in that one, it was the expression. But mm. the lady on the other side, no, girly. Girly lives in Port Royal. Mm. And I'm always, she's very willing. So if I'm walking with the first time I saw her I was with my camera, I said, girly, can I take your picture? And she said, what are you going to do with it? I said, it's just, me like take picture and, you know, I just want to have it. And she started, before I took the picture, she started telling me why she had it. This is something in her family, all of those little warts on her face. Mm. And that her son was actually getting it. That life made life interesting. Now I really wanted to take girly picture because I wanted to talk about it. Mm. You know? So she's in Port Royal. I go and I look for her from time to time and we talk. She's getting older. Mm. But have you ever seen anybody with something like this? You know what? I haven't. Not across their faces. Maybe um, in smaller bits, maybe along their neck, you know, possibly. But But not so many. Not like this. Not like this. Not like that. I love the color of our hair. This makes for a very interesting study, even for expression, you know? Yes. 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 I like our expression, even the the folded lips. And I know that it's only those of us of the African descent who does, who has that habit. The four lips. Yes. Four lips. Okay. Yes. I yeah. think that expression is saying to me too, Lord, I don't really want our take it, but take it. You know, it's like the uncertainty. Yeah. There's yeah. a little bit of uncertainty. You have certainly captured her for posterity. Boy James says, Boyd from Alric and Boyd fame says, yes, she used to teach me art. Ah, Here's this young man with this nice t-shirt looking like something similar to the um, henna tattoo you wore on your head one time. I love that. Yes. <laughs> this boy, I took this shot in St. Mary. Mm, with you know, in Jamaica, as you drive along the street, you have people selling. We're mm. having less of it these days, but in St. Mary, you can get your fruits along the way. You can get your cooked meal along the way. I thought this guy was just fabulous. 